Good morning and a well, warm welcome. Welcome back here to the second day of our symposium weekend here at Deutsches Film Museum. I welcome you all to a wonderful second day here this Sunday, celebrating 50 years of 2001 A Space Odyssey, of course accompanying our giant um, jubilee exhibition, Kubrick's 2001 50 Years of A Space Odyssey, which lasts until the end of September, September 23rd. And um, many of you, of course, have been here with us yesterday already, and it's a great pleasure to see you uh, here again uh, in the cinema. And we have um, a program containing different talks, um, discussions, and also film screenings here today. We start with a talk about the uh, reception of 2001's Architecture in Computer Games uh, by Mark Bonner. Uh, whom I will shortly introduce to you. And then we follow up with a talk by Simona Odino on the kubrick clark collaboration at uh, one o'clock. And that will be uh, followed by a screening of the animated feature film classic Wally -E by Andrew Stanton at three here in the cinema. And finally, we wrap up with a talk by Michael Günther, uh, the dubbing director of the German dubbed version of 2001 A Space Odyssey. So uh, 2001 Odyssey im Weltraum at five o'clock here in the uh, cinema again. And then we will screen, of course, 2001 in its German dubbed version uh, with Michael Günther and have a talk afterwards. So that's the program for today. And uh, I would also like to uh, mention that we have a nice selection of accompanying books in our mu museum's bookshop upstairs on the ground floor. Especially I would like to mention and draw your attention to Filippo Olivieri's book, uh, Stanley Kubrick and Me, 30 Years at His Side, uh, which we've already presented yesterday. And we have a few copies left, so if you want to uh, buy a book and uh, take it home as a souvenir of our symposium weekend, please feel free to uh, join the colleagues in the bookshop on the ground floor. And Filippo is still with us today, so I'm very happy um, that some of our uh, renowned speakers from yesterday are still here for today. So uh, my great pleasure is to uh, shortly introduce uh, Dr. Mark Bonner from Cologne University to you. His talk will focus on Kubrick's iconic set in the fourth act of the film and its impact on interiors and visual aesthetics in current computer games like Deus Ex Human Revolution from 2011 or Echo from 2017. The latter, as well as Portal 2 from 2011, also expand topics like non-Euclidean paradoxes and posthumanism beyond the semiotics of so-called environmental storytelling into game mechanics itself. Therefore, a preliminary overview on game intrinsic space will introduce the basic of games as digital media and experience spaces. Dr. Mark Morner from Cologne University is <laughs> since October 2017 the leader of the DFG funded research project uh, Open World Structures, Architecture, City and Landscape in Computer Games. From 2013 to 2017, he was lecturer at the, at the Institute sorry, for Media, Culture and Theatre at the University of Cologne. And from 2009 to 2013, he was lecturer at Saarland University. This was also where we first met uh, back in 2009. Uh, his main research interests include architecture of the 19th, the 20th and the 21st century, the depiction and function of architecture, the urban and landscape in computer games and film, science fiction film and transdisciplinary research between architecture, film and computer game. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Bonner. Yes, thank you, Niels, for the kind introduction and for having me here today. And um, thank you all for coming on an early Sunday morning. So you already heard the abstract um, concerning my talk. Um, and I will, of course, first give you the overview on game space and the architectonics of game space, so to speak, um, what is different to film um, with regard on the spatial visualization or depiction. 
Then I will shortly come to the hotel room or Louis XVI's room, as Ralph Fisher coins it. And after that, I will um, give you free case studies of current games. But let me start with a few remarks on science fiction theory. According to Simon Spiegel, science fiction is a mode of staging possible worlds of distant times or at distant places. Modern moves that focus on, technolo and on technical marvelousness um, that also induce an aura of plausibility. For Spiegel, the terms marvelousness and novelty are dominant agents for science fiction in order to exercise its effect. Set in the future, the world, its objects, or science have to be connected with our physical, real scientific reality. Spiegel defines the staging of a novelty as reality compliance, as naturalizing the marvelousness. Optical illusions, he says, like the pictures of M.C. Escher, maybe you all know these graphics, um, illustrate such impossible or non-Euclidic worlds. As we will see, the hotel room as well as Portal 2 and Echo stage such worlds by a distinct set of objects and aesthetics. The marvelousness is stretching the boundaries of the recipi recipient's willing suspension of disbelief in the sense of Samuel Teller Coleridge, which he coined in 1817 um, in context of literature. And this cognitive process is of special interest in my talk here today. Films, as well as computer games, mediate their diegetic worlds by representing three-dimensional space via two-dimensional screens. However, perception is different in both media. Architect and game scholar Michael Nietzsche defines films as linear descriptions, while computer games are nonlinear explorations. And I will quote him. In a 3D video game, one has to write one's own play in space by acting in it. Events need to be defined and realized in their spatial temporal setting by the player. The necessary eye of the virtual camera makes these spaces cinematic, and the interaction makes them accessible, much like architectural structures. Unquote. The coherent spatiotemporal interaction is the crucial momentum that divides both media. In 1975, film scholar Jean-Louis Baudry defined cinema as audiovisual simulation apparatus. This, of course, is also true to a computer game software running on a PC, laptop, or console. Cinema, as well as computers, focus on bonding or involving individuals extensively by the moving image. Baudry reveals the shortcomings of cinema and film by highlighting that the viewers aren't able to manipulate the point of view or interact with characters or plots of a film. Here, the distinct media ontology of the computer game as database and software that is in a feedback loop with the players fulfills this lag. The player's agency is crucial for the computer game to function to initiate its algorithms and thus to simulate complex worlds. With Nietzsche's description of games as nonlinear exploration and Baudry's vision of an agency in filmic space, German film scholar Vincent Hedegger insists that film can enable an appropriation or perpetration of filmic space cognitively. In such a way, filmic space can become a place, an active agent, as for the viewer, cognitive perpetration equals comprehension. So if you understand how um, a filmic space is constituted by visual markers, you know how to navigate the space just by reflecting on it. And Vincent Hedegaard, um, uses an example of 2001, of course, to make this clear. And it's the scene in the space shuttle approaching the space station Hilton 5, where you can see one little detail in the framing that is the floating pencil. And as it first may be barely visible, um, it's 
we focus for the scene because it marks the idea of zero gravity space within this shuttle. And this detail casually enables the mediation of technical and physical information without any dialogue or text. And this is the crucial thing Hedegaard tries to highlight. In its addition to the plot and the wider story world, um, it is very important for the idea of showing how space travel um, would be like. In such a function, the scene and its detail can be understood as filmic take on game design's environmental storytelling. And you have a lot of scenes in 2001 where you um, have the idea of navigating or traversing through zero-g space. At the end of the 20th century, computer games merged with architecture and film, which were themselves already interwoven. The fusion of the three disciplines is based on a common ground. Filmic space is represented by a linear sequence of pictures and corresponds, um, sorry, of pictures and fragmentation and virtuality. However, architecture and computer games build up a narrower relationship, both enrich the fusion with interactivity and nonlinear spatial experience by navigating spaces. Like a visitor in a museum or an opera, the player has limited as well as emergent courses of action. This is also stated by Stefan Günzel when he writes, and I quote, in contrast with the image of a film which presents a determinate movement that is passively received by the viewer, the movement in an interactive image must be induced by the viewer. Here the experience of the picture is constituted by the possibility of active navigation through a pictorial space. By this picture becomes a space image. Thus, while movies are characterized by the fact that they represent artificial motion, computer games are characterized by the fact that they present artificial navigation. And maybe you see the bridge from Heidegger to this definition of game space um, in the context of cognitive comprehension of perpetration of filmic space. This relates to the definition also of um, Swiss architect Peter Zumthor when he talks about architecture as the shell and background of life passing by, a container for the rhythm of movement. And this definition can be applied to digital game worlds where shell and background can be understood as walkable and playable level structures and non-walkable sceneries of the so-called skybox. And the gamers and their avatars represent life passing by. Rhythm can refer to the pacing of level structures which result in the artificial navigation. Said skyboxes are cubic or spherical structures that enclose the actual playable level or its section in order to let the level or game world appear much bigger than they are. Those background mappings mostly represent skies, distant mountain ridges, or cities and can simulate dynamic lighting and weather. So this is the stage design of computer games, so to speak. And as you can see with these two examples at the bottom, um, with Counter-Strike 1.6, um, the early types of skyboxes were just um, in a low resolution and just bitmaps, so just 2D, so that you really fast can see the idea of um, a theater-like stage design of the game space, while newer games can simulate volumetric clouds, day and night changes, um, atmospheric weather, climate changes, and so on. Like a panorama with its photo huh? they create the illusion of vastness and set limits to the navigation at the same time. The skybox's function reminds of the mud paintings of past analog filmmaking or of illusionistic perspectives in the tradition of Baroque trompe l'oeil paintings in buildings. While set designs, models, and mud paintings of pre-filmic space have to be aligned with the movements of the camera lens, the virtual camera is freely navigable within a certain district or area and enables players to choose the framing themselves. Therefore, level structures are constructed for their own sake and are sculpted more thoroughly as in the round architecture. 
So it's not just a facade of a building, but the whole building. Whether or not you can navigate through the whole building is uh, another topic. Thus, environmental storytelling and its subcategories are crucial game design techniques for player involvement and mediating player agency as well as propelling the story of the world. I'll just give you a few vital citations from game designers, media scholars, and theme park architects. I quote, any game that tries to create a sense of place uses architecture to define how that place feels to be. Architecture tells you where you are, but more than that, it also tells you what might happen to you there and even sometimes what you ought to be doing. So this is the special definition of game intrinsic architecture. Environmental storytelling creates the preconditions for an immersive narrative experience in at least one of four ways. Spatial stories can evoke pre-existing narrative associations. They can provide a staging ground where narrative events are enacted. They may embed narrative information within their mise-en-scene, or they provide resources for emergent narratives. So mostly if you walk through a uh, game world through a level structure, you are like a detective or like an archaeologist who um, does puzzling with a lot of objects and who tries to uh, combine them into the background story of the game world. Environmental storytelling fundamentally integrates player perception and active problem solving, which builds investment, and so on and so on. Okay, so this just for um, a starter, how the difference are well, should be evident between both medias. And now I will come to the hotel room scene. As I'm sure you all know the scene very well, let me summarize the aspects that are crucial for contextualizing 2001 with the three games mentioned before. During the space travel to Jupiter, David Bowman, played by Carduella, is forced to unplug the ethically and rationally conflicted HAL 9000 who controls the spaceship and kills his fellow colleagues in favor of company directive. Bowman overcomes his technically and AI-supported existence in transforming into the star child. For this talk, the fourth and final chapter, Jupiter and Beyond the Infinite, is of special interest. After transgressing the stargate, Bowman gazes with disbelief from within his space capsule into the all too familiar and earthly looking hotel room or Luce's room. But appearances are deceiving. This place with its artifacts from the Enlightenment era and the lighting floor panel deriving from an open plan office of modernism has the most surreal effect. As there are no windows, Bowman is not allowed to contextualize the space with a broader environment. Thus, Kubrick's staging increases the feel of isolation and estrangement. The Louis Saez room, uh, sorry, the Louis Saez and Direct Ra artifacts refer to times of change of French Revolution, the overcoming of the Ancien Regime, and are contextualized visually and cinematically by Kubrick's plot of human evolution and the overcoming of its prophesis. The paintings are citations to the light-hearted scenes of Rococo-style paintings in the Wien of François Boucher or Jean-Honoré Frajona. The Homo sapiens is an obsolete entity which needs to change or transgress from its current bond with its technical simulated reality. The hotel room as interior has a sterile atmosphere and is the novelty that is naturalized only in parts. The viewer's cognitive perpetration is intentionally hindered by Kubrick and the fixated point of views. There is no floating pencil or dialogue that naturalizes this virtual space completely. The hotel room contains the final confrontation with the marvelousness embodying monolith. The process of transgression of the once cold and emotionless astronaut Bowman is visualized by hard cuts and evident editing in shot reverse shot manner. First, Bowman strides a ghastly gazing and in full space suite through the Las Vegas style hotel room. Bowman now beholds older versions of himself each at a time. 
So the viewer first gets the point of view of a younger bowman and then perceives the point of view of the older bowman. With this change in perspective, the former younger bowman is extinguished in the second shot. The source of the younger bowman is not existing anymore. According to Ralph Fisher, there are four versions or incarnations of Bowman, who gets rid of his spacesuit and accustoms himself more and more to this alien habitat. With this process of vanishing Bowman versions, he seems to forget or ignore his human existence and the ontology of the hotel room. This process can also be contextualized with Jacques Lacan's mirror stage. The fragmented, incomplete body becomes an integral mirror image. The older but young Bowman, as well as the younger but aged Bowman, gather knowledge in reflecting each other Bowman's past, present, and future. He learns to see himself as an identity growing into something new. The viewers percept this process by the shot, reverse shot cinematography and the awareness in Bowman's, Bowman's eyes. Perceiving copies of oneself and Lacan's mirror stage are also crucial aspects I want you to remember when I will analyze Portal 2 and Echo. Both games also stage a multiplicity of the player's avatar that are inscribed in the game mechanics. These jumps in aging denote the evolutionary jumps in earlier chapters of the film. Finally, the fourth old and apparently dying Bowman transforms in presence of the monolith into the floating star child. The metamorphosis into the posthuman consciousness with Bowman's features transgresses through the monolith in near Earth orbit. And here I will stop with the last chapter of the movie. The marvelousness of the human evolution seems to be the coherent conclusion of this non-Euclidean place of the hotel room that, according to Clark's novel, was created out of the aliens' minds. And I will short, uh, give a short citation by Clark. His hosts had based the ideas of terrestrial living upon TV programs. His feeling that he was inside a movie set was almost literary true. And there are a lot of um, connections between the things Clark writes in his novel and the connection of the idea of game space, which I won't deepen here because it's another topic, but it's very interesting how, for example, the aliens have uh, a telephone book of Los Angeles, which is only just a book with empty pages. Um, and this is also true for all the assets and objects in computer games, where you just have a low poly object of a book which you can't open or can't read anything in it, or which has a blurry cover because they won't uh, um, use any more um, memory to, to do this uh, high resolution object in the game, you know, because they have to do a strategical um, management of memory power. As aliens staged this space, it is interesting how their eclecticism in interior styles is focused on surface appearances and how this reflects the ontology of level structures. The grid structure of the lighting floor panel refers to the Cartesian grid, which not only connotes the pure mathematical simulation character of the hotel room, which Fisher also imagines to exist behind the molded 18th century murals and the ceiling, but also of the game intrinsic space and its source from code and assets saved in databases. Many games even flaunt their regulating grid structure, as you can see with Minecraft and SimCity 2000. I will now come to the first case study, DSX Human Revolution. In the action RPG hybrid DSX Human Revolution, the player controls the mechanical augmented human Adam Jensen within a dystopian cyberpunk world. Here, current discourses of transhumanism are projected into a society that is torn apart between augmented and normal people. The marvelousness of augmentation and transhumanism topics is visually transported by a color palette of gold and black referring to the Renaissance and the neo-noir cyberpunk. Art director Jonathan Jacques Belletet emphasizes that mixing all the new styles and objects was crucial for the world building. I quote, if the Renaissance was about studying and understanding the human machine, cyberpunk is about upgrading it. 
Throughout the game world exist four distinct spatial arrangements that embody key moments of the complex plot and use eclectic interior design systems, uh, interior science systems, sorry, very similar to Kubrick's hotel room. The sterile technical self-contained spaces full of artifacts referring to early modern age and enlightenment era evoke conflicting atmospheres of delimitation and warmth, humanism and otherness. First, the prestigious office of augmentation producing company founder David Sarif perfectly shows the black gold color code. It directly refers to the hotel room by a glowing floor panel. Its inner layout also sports a geometric pattern that resembles Spanish wooden ceilings of the 16th century. The diffuse lighting of Sarif's office is as mystifying as in the hotel room. Besides that, the furniture is a mix of modernism and classicism. A big flat screen and holographic globe in a wooden framework, as well as the prospect onto Detroit cityscape, denote Sarah's claim to power. So the globe alone as a science system to uh, a claim to power is very, um, is a topoi, a topoi in the um, art history. If you look at uh, um, paintings of the 16th and 17th century of um, wealth, Netherlands, and Spanish, um, I don't know the word in English for Kaufmänner right now. I have a, so. But here you can see how it all is intermingled. You have some earthly things like the baseball league projection on the flat screen, but you also have books and different styles of furniture. The open fireplace as well as paintings like Rembrandt's anatomy lesson, you can see it there, complete the space and the function of an embedded space. Like the alien's hotel room, this interior connotes human culture and its achievements that derive through progress and an ever-changing worldview. While the hotel room is engrossed and denies a decoding and full contextualization, Serif's office is the first destination of the game and freely accessible in order to set an atmosphere to the character and the cyberpunk world, before Serif himself enters the office and the dialogue sequence starts. Second, the apartment of the playable avatar Jensen is also a walk-in area that can be freely accessed throughout the playthrough. Its open layout, the dim atmosphere in combination with the dark color palette and the casting shadows of the animated blinds evidently reminds of the iconic set design of Tyrell's office in Ridley Scott's Blade Runner. But scale, rolling upholstery and wooden reveals in contrast to flat screens and LED chandeliers refer to the hotel room. Especially the upholstery seems similar to an Ottoman of Louis Saez style. Also, there is a warm female acousmetra that, like HAL 9000, controls the apartment and greets the player. Um, but it's that with this acousmetra, there's nothing more to it. This place is less sterile because of the heavy use of wood. Detroit's cityscape as fort terrain or passive level structure of the skybox lights the apartment that is as cozy and as strange at the same time. Exploring artifacts and graphics, using the furniture and interacting with the PC, the player again is in an enclosed embedded space that enables to learn details about the avatar Jensen and the game world by its interior arrangement, but also conceals aspects. It mystifies and evokes the need to investigate the whole game world further. So here you can see the broken mirror and you can ask yourself why did your avatar broke this mirror? There are a lot of things like that to reflect on. Third. Okay. 
the quarters of Seraph's mentor Hugh Darrow more closely resemble the hotel room. Within the diegesis, Darrow is the inventor of mechanical augmentations. His own DNA is incomp incompatible to augmentations. In his philanthropic worldview, he builds a mass destruction weapon which could destroy all augmentations in order to reveal the shortcomings of cybernetic augmentations to mankind. In contrast to the first two places as enclosed embedded spaces, this solely white interior is situated at the end of a labyrinthian level structure that depicts the research facility Omega Ranch in Singapore. It also functions as embedded space that is only accessible after sneaking and shooting through the facility and winning a boss fight. The quarter sterile white monochromacity is in stark contrast to the overall gold black color palette of the game world. Although there are curtains covering the walls, this room lacks windows. The white rolling upholstery, the grid floor, as well as the murals also refer directly to the set design of 2001. Walking closer to the walls, one can see the iconic pattern of circuit boards as decor and inner layout shimmering on the molded murals. This, as well as the shutdown android and the polymorphic ceiling connote with their technicity Darrow's work as originator of augmentations. It is unclear where the light source is situated, which propels the room further as a place of delimitation and estrangement. Chandeliers with real candles, a gramophone, and a sextant again point back to bygone eras of mankind's achievements in astronomy and navigation of the 18th century and communication of the 19th century. They foil the Android circuit board decor and the random noise of multiple screens. The surreal, this surreal mise-en-scene is experienced completely abruptly after playing the tropes of action RPG and navigating the level in Prospect Refuge manner. Its atmosphere evokes Darrow's intentions and can be described as liminal space where the players also gather new plot informations. Fourth, the Limp Clinic is situated in the intricate, narrow hub space that is the public space of fictional Detroit. This is also a place that is repeatedly accessed during the playthrough. Its facade is heavily influenced by Toyo Ito's organic structure for Tots Omotesando in Tokyo. Typically for certain game architecture, its interior does not correspond to the exterior appearance and volumes. Especially the foyer and the waiting area of the augmentation clinic use three distinct aspects of the hotel room set design. The grid floor panels that light the spaces, the white molded murals as well as rolling upholstery. While the furniture is of a dark color, there are more light sources like LED chandeliers and advertising panels. This interior is just a transit area, but it generates an atmosphere of liminality of becoming a mechanically augmented human, a transhuman entity. It exercises its e effects only by citing iconic aspects of Kubrick's surreal film set where space traveler Bowman becomes the star, the star child, a posthuman entity. <coughs> All four interiors in Deus Ex Human Revolution are no active level structures in the sense of multiple pathways, arenas, of fighting or circumventing enemies, but enclosed rooms as embedded spaces a subcategory of environmental storytelling focusing on mediating story and world solely by its arrangement of objects, by its interior sign system. Their spatial arrangements are eclectic in style and in form of the past of all three main characters as well as of the wider story of the cyberpunk world. In embedded spaces, players only can observe artifacts, find story fragments, putting clues together, or initiate dialogue sequences and cutscenes. They rely heavily on the visual aesthetics and spatial arrangement, and in this case, on the atmosphere of Kubrick's hotel room set that is internalized by several science fiction movies after 1968, as well as by broader pop culture. The combination of all the new artifacts of modernism floor panels and 18th century mooded murals of rolling upholstery, circuit board decor, 
and diffuse lighting of thematizing the Enlightenment era and mankind's achievements is crucial in all examples. That said, all four interiors do this by different poignancies of which Darrow's quarters seem to be the most evident citation of 2001. The topic of changing worldviews of man's prophesis and the metamorphosis into a post or transhuman entity is also embodied in both David Bowman becoming the star child and heavily augmented Adam Jensen. Both protagonists are estranged from society and isolated, whether spatially by sheer distance or cultural philosophically by multiple augmentations and investigating between interest groups. Both are in a liminal, liminal phase. The first person puzzle platformer Portal 2 stages complex and diversified sets of architecture as non Euclidean spatial puzzles. Controlling female test subject Chell, players have to find a way through the megalomaniac subterranean research facility of the Aperture Sciences Company. The vast, desolate, and deserted game world is perceived in a segments mostly embodied by the facility's test chambers or industrial sites. Due to the lack of prospects or windows, the spatial array is unclear. Like Bowman in the fourth act of 2001, Chell doesn't have a single line of dialogue during the gameplay. The narrative in Portal 2 is based on very thoughtful dark comedy, mono and dialogues by two AIs. Antagonist GLaDOS, who controls the building complex, and you can see her in the upper left corner, and Wheatley, who first helps Chell, but only to step her in the back. Both try to allure the players, present unreliable information with warm, interviewing voices, which is a direct reference to Hell 9000, because they also have a British accent. In such a way, players are forced to reflect on the current situation on their own, instead of passively listen to the avatar's outspoken thoughts and comments on the game world and the interaction with it. The environmental storytelling as well as the gameplay mechanics are crucial to the world, to the world experience. Consequently, the atmosphere and therefore the immersion is more profound and entirely linked to spatial temporal experience. Portal 2's unique environmental storytelling through architectural languages and their systems of meaning is, in case of the subterranean laboratory complex, largely accomplished by the adaption of certain works of Japanese architects like Tadao Ando, Arata Isosaki, or Kisho Kurukawa. So, as you clearly can see, it's more about the space-time idea of Ma, which is a really common thing in Japan, than on the eclectic style Kubrick did with the hotel room. The hodological game space is segmented wholesale in seemingly limitless succession of Kubo test chambers made of different building materials and surface aesthetics that derive from a certain game intrinsic iconic code merging the established space-consuming atmospheres of Ando and Isosaki. But nonetheless, there is some context to the Space Station 5, as I may say, with all the grid structures and the sterile, white, shiny surfaces. These test chambers are irregularly and unconventionally shaped architectural interiors so that the players as pedestrians are unable to traverse them by conventional movement patterns. The players have to use the portal gun to shoot an entrance and an exit portal on certain materials of the architecture in order to fold two different places of the same space on each other. Thus, only by creating an Einstein-Rosen bridge, better known as a wormhole, the players can find a way through the unclear cuboid test chambers. In other words, by perceiving space and interacting in its defining architecture beyond the Euclidean logic, one finds a hodological solution, the only way out of Portal 2's opposing and challenging building complex. Actual spatial temporal perpetration and cognitive perpetration are key to understand the level structure. So we are back at Hedega again. To create a placeness and thus use or overcome physical laws, 
Here the player himself becomes the floating pencil, if you can follow me with this metaphor. The experience of physics and gravity of non-Euclidean logics is the marvelousness and resembles multiple scenes from 2001, be it the zero-g spaceflight scenes or the hotel room's delimitation. In contrast to Deus Ex Human Revolution's duplication of Heidegger's comprehension approach, here it becomes an actual active gameplay mechanic which propels the perception even further. So you are not just perceiving a space, a filmic space, and might cognitively um, comprehend the perpetration, but you um, comprehend this perpetration by actively perpetrated by yourself. Environmental storytelling here becomes an agent to solve puzzles by folding different places within a test chamber through the creation of a coherent spatial temporal interval with two portals, the player's movement patterns linked to it. The megalomaniac architecture in Portal 2 is a tactile ontological presence that again depicts an abandoned dystopia and projects loneliness towards the players. As top and bottom are only of use for gaining momentum through certain constellations of portal loops, all directions of the three-dimensional space as well as the dimension of time in the manner of cubism must be taken in consideration. As Bowman gazes to older versions of himself, Chell, your avatar, paradoxically also can see herself at several places at once by folding the test chambers. With Portal 2, it is not so much the referencing and adaption of 2001's visual aesthetics, namely the iconic eclectic hotel room scenery and all the topics, values and atmospheres that are linked to its science system, but more the idea of traversing and experiencing liminal space of perpetrate surreal places of non-Euclidean character and of using sterile white grid structures as ordering system within the game mechanics. The third person stealth action game Echo stages, continuous palace stages a single continuous palace complex stretching out over a whole planet. Once players descend with their female avatar N between the modular infinite surface pattern into the gorge, the desolate ruinous metal industry resembling exterior makes place for a sterile and extravagant interior that appears unused and seems deserted. It is not clear what the function of the pompous palace was. Its vastness and emptiness is one of its biggest myths. Like Kubrick's hotel room, the palace's marvelousness is naturalized only in parts. As the palace architecture appears almost familiar in its language by merging several styles from 18th century Rococo and Classicism to geometric art deco to the digital age of connoting um, circuit board decor, it is as shiny as it is opaque. The interior completely lacks any windows and mostly uses white, black, and gold with a few blurs of color here and there. Though a representational architecture type, this specific palace only is constituted of multi-story stairways, atriums, foyers, vast symmetri symmetrical halls, and cathedral high hallways, as well as narrow intertwined corridors and galleries, cascading terraces, dining halls and office-like quarters with scarce usage of furniture in the vein of Louis Sass style Ottomans desks and chairs. As such, this aloof and alienating architecture reminds more of megalomaniac non-places as seen in Las Vegas casinos than palaces with lift spaces like libraries, tea rooms, antechambers, etc. In several parts of the architecture, there are also grid-like floor panels that light the rooms besides the LED chandeliers. It is evident that the interiors of this alien game world refer directly to Kubrick's hotel room, not only in style and atmosphere, but also in the estranging sounds and the aspect that the palace somehow has a conscience. Whether it is an AI or not remains unclear, but as the avatar N is accompanied by the British and warm-sounding voice of her spaceship's AI, it is very likely. 
The ship's AI also criticizes Anne's action and her transhuman nature as an aristocrat that lives multiple lifespans on the cost of other lives. In several interviews, game director Mark M. Borg includes Borg's short story, The Library of Babel, as well as 2001 and Solaris among the key inspirations that, according to him, exist as part of our collective sensibilities. With its focus on symmetry, high redundancy, and repetition, the interior uses core characteristics of digital media, namely the modularity and variability of assets. Therefore, the palace also directly denotes its ontology as algorithmic-driven database entity, and thus is also self-reflexive on the level of being a game-intrinsic space that needs to be appropriated. Beyond that, this database revealing design strategy also has an impact on players, as Gareth Damien Martin emphasizes. And I will now give you a very long citation, but it uh, hits the point with this game. Repetition is an, is an inherent part of game spaces. In any one game, we constantly walk past the same models of pots, crates, and chairs, seeing them a hundred times over. It's part of how games tell us what is important by concentrating new items and detail in areas of interest while filling out spaces of transit with the same old patterns. The art lies in masking and spacing these patterns so that they don't become too distracting or conspicuous. Echo, in service of a sense of terror, throws all that out the airlock and instead employs this language of repetition to keep the player in a state of overwhelming oppression. Its repeated patterns are so obvious, so constant as to be unnerving, and its level of detail saturates the player's vision. You might inspect the carefully arranged and beautifully modeled place settings that lie on its ornately carved tables when you first encounter them. But once you find them stretched out across a banquet hall that the length of five football fields, you start to feel a little dizzy. The result is a masterclass in architectural manipulation, the classical language of pillars, orders, and composition pushed to an inhuman extreme. And I think that makes my point clear with the hotel room scenery, although it is very cozy in scale. Beyond visual aesthetics and spatial layouts, the repetition is also inherent in the game mechanics and the player's courses of action. Like Bowman in the hotel room, players are confronted with an ever-growing numbers of copies of N brought into life by the palace. Sad copies learn from every action the players execute because the palace scans every play pattern. Are they clones? Are they synthetic or organic? Are they posthuman? It is not known. Using weapons, running and sneaking then become strategic decisions in exploring the level structures because after the palace's reboots by a ghastly sound and fading into black, the copies then are updated and will be able to start shooting or sneaking behind the player in order to knock him out too. The result is a rhythmical push and pull as you slip constantly between the huge groups of enemies that patrol these holes. And copies are prostheses of the palace, and like Bowman in the hotel room, the players are in a kind of Lacanian mirror stage. In seeing the adapted play patterns of the copies, players gather knowledge about themselves as players. This meta-reflective mirroring forces them to act in, a, in the game world in favor of themselves in preventing that the copies may use established or effective movement patterns and play behaviors. An ever-actualizing of one's own role as a player is key to win this game and heavily depends on the layout of the current level structure. So instead of Bowman, who uh, seems to forget his human past by um, gazing at his older versions, here you as a player um, have to deepen your knowledge on your role as a player and therefore as the human part in this uh, game in this um, software you are playing in. Now I'm coming to my conclusion. Sorry. Like the test chambers as prosthesis of Gladys in Portal 2, 
The silent megalomaniac palace plays an active role in the game world. The architecture of both games embody the antagonist and opponent for the players. Consequently, with the examples of Echo and Portal 2, we experience a coincidence of Hell 9000's Villainous acting as a controlling AI of the spaceship, which becomes the opponent to Bowman, with the iconic delimitate, delimitated non-Euclidean scenery of the hotel room. Both games not only broach the issue of post-humanity or humanity at a whole, but also reveal what it is like to be the gear wheel in a game world constituted by the game state and its algorithms. While in Echo and Portal 2, it can be experienced what it is like to be Bowman outplaying Panoptical Hell 9000 within an enclosed structure, Deus Ex Human Revolution only uses visual aesthetics from 2001 A Space Oddity, Odyssey, I'm not with uh, David Bowie here, as embedded narratives. The iconic set design and analog production quality of 2001 still is on par with science fiction films of today and often is superior to digital productions. It is not surprising that directors like Christopher Nolan, Duncan Jones, Jonathan Glazer or Denis Villeneuve visually and production-wise are heavily influenced by Kubrick's masterpiece. Regarding its impact on pop culture and collective memory, it is also not surprising that the topics, values, atmospheres and visual aesthetics of this cult classic are mixed, adapted or cited in current computer games. By updating discourses like trends and posthumanism, as well as man-machine dualism, the, leg the legacy of Kubrick's vision is transferred into the 21st century, into new media that propels the spatial-temporal spatial purpose perpetration and comprehension of the moving image. Which leaves only one question. Why isn't there a game adaption of 2001, A Space Oddity? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mark, for this uh, really stimulating opening talk for today. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, we have now plenty of time to discuss them. Maybe there are some first impulses after this intervention by Mark. Please just um, give me a, a short uh, sign, raise your hand, and I'll come to you with the mic, because we are again recording this for our YouTube channel. Are there any questions, comments so far? Yes. Um, I would like to start to with, with the notation that uh, uh, after 2001, Stanley Kubrick made a very controversial film, which is the, the most controversial of all time, which is uh, Clockwork Orange. And my question is, therefore, since you are a scholar in the, <coughs> in the topics of uh, uh, computer game and... Uh, um, virtual reality, let's say. I would like to know if uh, uh, you are aware of any study that has been conducted about the influence that this uh, new technology has on human brain and uh, most uh, more uh, precisely on, 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 human, on um, young people. So what is the impact of this exercise? Uh, in terms of how long you are playing and how old or how young you are. So I would like to know if uh, you are aware of any of this study and if you can make some comment on this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, as I'm coming from art history and being a scholar in media studies, um, of course I'm aware of such studies, but such studies are mostly with... Um, so sociology and um, communication studies, for example. So it's an, another um, approach to do these things. And there are a lot of studies and you can really um, dig deep in these things. I think that's, it's a topic, uh, yeah, how to say it. Maybe we can talk afterwards about these things. So, so you mean the impact of, of uh, game space and how long you play in games, right? That's the thing you actually wanted to know. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. The point that I wanted to make is that I believe that Kubrick was Adult's very, type. very concerned about these topics, yeah. and in fact, the next movie is 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 a, a clear indication of that. And um, but the movie is mostly about brainwashing, not about virtual reality. Yes, but you could say that in the moment that you have new technology, which uh, according to, to study, they are, they are capable of, of influencing very heavily, especially young people, then we are already walking on a very thin line. Where is the, 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 the yeah, border? But that, that's with, not with only the case with computer games, you know. You had this case with photography, you had this case with film. So it's an ever-changing... So to speak, it's a loop in human history. With every new medium, there is the idea of complete immersion into this new medium. For example, um, nowadays it's on vogue to have this virtual reality goggles, you know? Oculus Rift and HTC, HTC Vive and how they are all called. And you already had these things in the 60s and 70s, but they became not that uh, practical in everyday life. And there was already one point or the first point where humans really forgot their body in their physical real space. So this is one point where you can say, okay, virtual reality or computer games had a very critical impact on the human body. But with um, normal computer games you play on the screen, I would say it depends on the people you are studying, on the games you are studying, so you can't do one study that talks about all of these things, you know. There are a lot of studies that go on about uh, um, violence in computer games, which nowadays is a, is a topic no one wants to touch anymore because it's, yeah, it's uh, maybe something for psychologists um, still, but for all the other disciplines not. And you have also a lot of studies um, about the idea of forming groups or um, practicing social actions you would like normally would do uh, on the playground for example and you have them now in the multiplayer online games there is a lot of things so I can't tell you one study or one conclusion of a study right now there's a lot you know what I mean but again I think uh, the idea of uh, Clockwork Orange had nothing to do with virtual reality. So thank you very much uh, for uh, the talk. Uh, I also um, am very interested in the point that uh, there has to be a certain kind of uh, media literacy and awareness for getting the cognitive signals in the game, uh, especially in regard uh, to getting lost in immersive worlds. I think one of the most interesting aspects about the Portal series is that you have a kind of unreliable uh, spatial structure mm -hmm. because you are trained to be skeptical about uh, health's uh, relative. If you follow all the instructions uh, by the machine, it will be uh, absolutely fatal for you because uh, this is a kind of unreliable narrator that is uh, putting you into the wrong direction, always promising you a cake uh, as a reward for uh, your game actions. But uh, the important thing is that you have to learn to distrust the machine and to uh, be aware that uh, it uh, is uh, leading you into a trap. So I think uh, there's also a kind of uh, reflective element in the game architecture. And um, I was wondering uh, how this kind of unreliable space fits in between uh, the shore coded space that is quite obvious, semiotic, and on the other hand, the non-Euclidean uh, space uh, of all the puzzles. So I think maybe there's a kind of intersection with uh, this unreliable space that you have to decode to uh, become aware that uh, the computer is leading you into a trap. Yes, thank you for this remark. You're absolutely right. And um, the interesting thing is with Portal, you have a lot of scenes, especially in the first third of the game and later on when Wheatley becomes the controlling AI of the research facility where the AIs try to, to build these rooms where you are tested. And they comment on this. So Wheatley, for example, does this for uh, the first time and he's not, uh, not that um, 
firm with the idea of controlling the space and building up the space. So you see a lot of kinetic um, architecture that is currently folding in some room or place or whatnot. So there you have a lot of um, scenes bet in between your play action where you can um, see right this unreliable architecture. Any more questions, comments to Mark Bonner? and the computer games architecture in comparison to 2001, yes, please. Thank you. Um, as it is, I'm, I'm an architect and I was part of the first digital architects in the 90s exploring computation for form generation or form finding. Um, I see the potential in the the environment but what i see then in the environment is more or less kit bashing <laughs> it's more or less sampling and citation and cliche mm -hmm. uh, i don't really see yet any any intrinsic new approach to space space-time relationships maybe in in in, in the dialectics behind it but mm -hmm. not in the visual surface mm -hmm. so what do you think about that? And do you see a potential for a new form of spatial representation or narrative, architectural narrative that might immerse in this uh, environment? Yes, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, so these examples are mostly examples that play in linear corridors, so to speak. Um, and right now you have a lot of games called open world games, which is my current study with the DFG funding, um, where you have complete landscapes, complete cities to explore. And uh, I would say that, this, that there is a lot of potential in it, but as you said, it's all sampled from known science systems, from known ac architectural languages. And this has of course to do with the idea that the computer game is an entertainment product and it has to be uh, sold. And for this, you have to design game spaces that the player can decode directly, you know, so to speak. So, ah, okay, uh, the villain is now uh, dwelling in a Gothic architecture, of course, or I don't know, you are um, infiltrating a bank and this bank looks very like um, something like, I don't know, uh, classicism architecture, so to speak. And um, these are these typical topics or topoys of architecture you had also in classicism, for example. And you have actually very, very seldom games that try to do something different, um, not only in the uh, idea of uh, aesthetics, but also in the idea of spatial temporal um, experience. And this has a lot to do with the idea of being a mass medium, being of an, an entertainment system with the last 10, 15 years, you have this uh, subculture uh, called indie games, and there are a lot of um, RT approaches towards this. So there are a lot of new things going on. There, is, there are things you can say, this is new, this has potential, but they are not really played by a lot of people. So because there are more, a lot of games, for example, where you don't have to shoot, or you don't have to gain points, or don't have to solve a clue, but just move through the space, just have this effective phenomenological idea of uh, virtual space, so to speak. And for most players, this is not enough. They, they, are, they think they are, um, how to say it, um, they are cut down in their agency and so they think, okay, I don't want to buy this game because I don't have to do something in it, because they can't reflect the idea that uh, computer games can be more than just shooting and jumping and uh, gaining points for something. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, the, the interesting thing is you also, with big titles, you have a lot of architects uh, working in this, uh, uh, in this industry and they are all very depressed. So they studied architecture very young, so my age may be born in the 1980s, early 1980s, and um, they come to big companies and build Florence, for example, the Renaissance Florence within the architecture. Um, 
and they have to regulate their buildings in order that the avatar can jump on them and scale the facades and everything like this. So you can't really build them that intricate as they were or as they are in reality. Um, also, there are a lot of elements in these architectures that don't belong there in that time. So there are a lot of things going on with this. And I had uh, um, interviews with a lot of architects who said, uh, after a few years, uh, I go back into the architectural industry because there I can be uh, creative, you know. There I can try out new forms. Um, for example, if you look at, at things like uh, Zaha Hadid or something like this, or Ole Scheren who tries new things, so to speak, at least at a star architect level, um, this is more progression as in the game world. Which is interesting because in the game world, it's not a physical space. You don't have material that costs. You have the artists that cost, of course. But you could do so much more within it. And yeah. Also, an interesting thing is that in architectural industry, um, they mostly try to build their own engines, graphical engines. It all started with CUT, as I uh, know it. And um, there were a lot of um, tryouts with game engines, but they are specified on different things. So it is not that functional for architects to build or to plan architecture with game engines, which is also an interesting thing because I would say there is a point where a lot of potential would come through if both industries would come together, so you see. Yeah, thank you for this remark. I really liked your point, um, how you showed to us um, that the last chapter, the fourth and final chapter of 2001 with the Louis XVI room or the hotel room, um, kind of is predestined architecture-wise to be taken up in computer games architecture. But uh, taking up your, um, your last point or your opening remark at the end, uh, having a uh, yeah, kind of computer games adaptation of the whole film, how about the other three chapters of 2001. Are there other examples in other video games? Uh? Well, there are currently um, in a few days, well, that is not 2001, but in a few days there comes a game that is called We Happy Few, and it hits uh, heavily on um, the Clockwork Orange movie. So it has this 60s, 70s pop aesthetic, and it's a lot about drugs and how to perceive people. And it's very, very interesting. If you, if you see the, the, the style, the aesthetics, you directly see, OK, this is Clockwork Orange. Um, the other chapters of 2001, you have a lot of games, uh, at least in the last few years, where you play as an astronaut in zero G, where you are floating through whole stations and you have to, to, um, to, to solve puzzles or um, reconstruct the station. Um, I would say this is very heavily um, concentrated on chapter two and three, but in the idea of the narrative, it's more contextualized with something like um, Event Horizon, for example, <laughs> or with Solaris. So it's more about the interconnection of astronauts in the idea. Um, and yes, there are a lot of games where you play animals or pre-homo sapiens, but I don't see there an, a narrow connection to 2001. So I would say no, <laughs> probably. Uh, first, thank you for uh, your enlightening um, talk. Uh, but when I look at what you presented and also some of the comments uh, we've heard today, um, I see the current game industry as something for me personally rather disappointing because what they use and and you said it yourself is they are they are uh, basically copying what we know from real life they are uh, having a lot of citations from movies or uh, real life scenarios um, the idea was portal to connect rooms or to fold rooms uh, using wormholes to travel. That is something a little bit unique, but we've seen that in Time Bandits and other movies already, so it's n not really a new concept. Well, it is in this case of the medium new, as you have to think about the space yourself, you know, instead you have to, to act it out yourself. So that is really a new thing in this 
context, but okay, you can create or manipulate or all of a sudden fall through a wormhole yourself and then right. you discover a completely new situation. That is what you're meaning. Because I what, I, what I showed you, the two um, short clips of the game, there's uh, this were examples of players that already knew how to do it, you know. You have a lot of trial and error to, to solve these rooms. This is a very, very complex game. It's, But all yeah. these games, a question to you, all these games have kind of a deterministic layout mm -hmm. so the programmer has to create all the connections mm -hmm. and all the rooms and all, situa all the situations that may happen in advance so it's like a, a cross-folded storybook maybe yeah. call it that way but everything is predefined so there's nothing that gets created on the fly by some kind of AI in the game Maybe that should be something to look forward to. There are games that do to, it. to create yeah. situations all by a sudden through AI or by coincidence, mm -hmm. by a random generation mm -hmm. algorithm or something like that. There are games that are doing I'm, this. So. I'm a little bit disappointed, as I said in the beginning, because my first computer game was Pong. And my second computer game was Space Invaders. Mm -hmm. Yes, I confess, I'm pretty old for uh, the computer industry. And uh, that's why I'm still longing to see something really challenging, really new, really, yeah, looking, the uh, looking at the features that modern computer technology and AI gives us and could surprise me. Yeah. That is what I would like to see. Real surprise. And then maybe I buy a console or a PC game. Uh, I'm sadly not, not one of the game years. industry people, but I know what you're talking about. And as I said before, there are games that are doing this. Um, there are games that use procedural generation in game world. So that the game world um, is built on the fly where the, where the player goes. And you wouldn't see this um, game world... Um, on a PC by another player. Minecraft is an example for this. So Minecraft is a game mostly called as Digital Lego, where you can do a lot of yourself. You, you produce the content, the funny term prosumer. And um, there are a lot of things possible. You can, within Minecraft, you can build an AI yourself. You can build an AI that does, this, uh, that does math or something like this. And this is a very special thing. So Minecraft is uh, really something that shows us the potential of future games. Um, and there are a lot of games that try to adapt to it, but yeah, that's just a bleak copy. And as I said, there are games with uh, a higher AI or a higher deep learning AI, but AI is not that far. AI is not that far. Not only in the computer game industry, but as a whole. Every people, everyone thinks that there is uh, in five years something like Skynet that will destroy us. This is not true. So, and we have, yeah, we have to, to commit to the fact that the game industry, mostly in uh, um, connection with the movie industry, um, mostly focused in the last 20, 30 years on the graphics and not on AI. So it's mostly about the visuals, the visual aesthetics and The complex AIs you see, they seem complex because the game uh, mechanics are very limited in some games or most games. And the AI, so the opponent you see, um, is very specified to two or three strategies and actions you do yourself. So they seem very intelligent, but it's not true. I mean, um, I don't know if you are firm with the company Boston Dynamics. Does anyone know of Boston Dynamics? So they were bought by the military and they have these uh, walking robots, um, dogs as well as human two pedals that can open doors, that can uh, navigate through space autark, independent, without someone steering them. This is also no intelligent AI. They have sensors and these sensors um, um, collect the information of the space and they react to it. But it's not an AI that is thinking for itself, that is creative in some kind of way. And as long as we are not 
somewhere near that, I don't think that games will be more, how to say, procedural, deep learning, complex. As I said, there are examples like Minecraft where are a lot of things going on where you can see the potential, the future of this. Maybe you saw the movie Ready Player One. I would say if at some time VR goggles would be um, practical, practical in everyday life, which I don't think, um, you would have something like Minecraft with goggles so that you really meet yourself up in such a space and you can create things and do things like um, a lot of architectural firms try to accomplish right now with such systems as CAVE or something like this, where they are with three or four architects within a skybox, so to speak, with goggles on and try to create or design architecture to find new ways in designing architecture, which is also interesting again that there is the more creative potential as in the games industry. Well, thanks. Uh, thank you, Mark, first of all, for your uh, presentation. Um, and thank, thanks, thanks especially for introducing us to the last video game you showed, uh, the one from 2017, which looks absolutely spectacular. Um, answering Neil's uh, question about uh, adaptations, real ad adaptations of the 2001 uh, saga, in, at least in Clark, uh, in Clark terms, there had there was um, an adaptation of 2010, the movie, in the mid 80s, uh, from for a console that possibly the um, the the guys above 45 here <laughs> may uh, remember it was called ColecoVision, and um, obviously the game being from the mid 80s had such a um, 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 an inadequate mm -hmm. <laughs> um, ad adaptation in terms of um, game mechanics, especially which uh, cannot be used, of, of course, for <laughs> for a presentation like that. Just to be yeah. precise, I, I, I've looked at it in some emulators, and uh, I, it's not that fun to play. <laughs> uh, like most games of these times, yeah. It, it, it's actually uh, better to watch 2010, and that speaks volumes. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the problem with with uh, Games in these days that are uh, movie adaptions, they are not playable. They are just thrown out onto the market to get by. The best example is the E.T. game that was on an Amiga cartridge, as I recall it right. And it was that a flop that they took the whole production of the cartridges and dumped it into the desert. And after, I don't know, 30 years, they digged it out again. And nowadays they are an archae archaeology artifact and they are bought on um, on how, eBay for a lot of money. You had you you yeah yeah you managed to to get one for here right. <laughs> and it is not playable. You can't play it. I had it myself back in the days when I was that high, and it is not playable. And that's with most of these games that's adapted movies in in these years. Thanks. I think it would be a really interesting challenge to find uh, ways of adaptation for the other chapters of the films because uh, there are a few attempts uh, to do this. For example, uh, the game Elite, an um, open world uh, space simulator from the 1980s. It starts out with uh, under schönen blauen Donau with uh, the walls and uh, all uh, the uh, impressions you have when it uh, switches after the match cut to uh, the year 2001. But at the same time, there is the interesting problem. There isn't really so much dramatic action. So you really have the difficulty there. You have this meditative aspect of flying through space and maybe discovering nothing for several hours. There was also an open world a game that wasn't that successful. Do you remember what it's called a few years ago? Where no Man's Sky. No Man's Sky, exactly. So if you want to try out what it must be to get lost in space after hell has been shut down and having no Stargate, the game is exactly this experience. No Man's Sky is such a game where you have a procedurally generated universe, 30 trillion planets you can discover. You wouldn't have the lifetime to do it, but you possibly, potentially could do it. And it's very interesting because it's, it's really simulating something like this vast and something like exploring what could 
have meant exploring in the 17th century in the far west, you know. Um, and these planets are mostly deserted and it's the, 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 the sole function in the game is to, to navigate into the center of the universe and to stay alive because these planets are mostly um, very hostile to your avatar. So you have to, to uh, dig out materials, you have to craft things to keep alive and everything like this. So you're more crafting and uh, collecting materials than something else in this game, which is also very redundant and depressing. Uh, thank you all for all your comments. Just uh, taking up um, Simona's remark, uh, I have to to add, or just for the record, um, to hint upon our um, cinemas program, because just uh, next week we will screen 2010 by Peter Himes, the, <laughs> the sequel in this very room, um, being introduced by uh, Robert Vogel. So thank you again for all your contributions for the discussion. Uh, thanks for your comments and your questions. and. Uh, most of all, thanks to Mark Bonner for this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.